Well, good morning, or afternoon, or, or evening, depending on when it is that you're watching this video. And welcome to the 2021 Prince George High School Baccalaureate Service. My name is Lee Woodcock, and I serve as the pastor of Oakland Baptist Church, the setting for the filming of this service today. And let me just say before we begin uh, that I know that this is not the senior year that you imagined. Unfortunately, I said those same words last year to the class of 2020. I would imagine that as a child, uh, when you would dream of your graduation, when you would dream of your senior year, uh, this is not what you had in mind. That being so, I just want to say on behalf of all the pastors in the area and on behalf of your community that we're proud of you. And we look forward to the days ahead as you continue to grow and as you continue to mature in the faith. We, we look forward to what God is going to do in and through you as you live your lives for his glory. And so again, I would welcome you this morning. And I pray that the Lord might bless our service here today as we seek uh, to not only honor you, our graduates, but ultimately to honor and to glorify him as all things were created through him and for him. Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you, Lord, in awe, knowing that you are the ruler of all things. God, I ask that as we proceed here today in this service that you would be made much of, that our love for, for your son Jesus would be increased in our hearts. I pray, God, for the Christians listening today, that you would give them power, that their desires and that their dispositions would be Christ-like, and that you, O oh God, would, would bring them and all of us to full Christian maturity, that we might show Christ in all that we are, and in all that we think, and in all that we desire, and in all that we say, our Father, and that all that we do. And I pray, God, that having experienced that, that we would desire to be your instruments used by you and for you. Lord, you are the maker of hearts, and our hearts are they're restless until they find rest in you. Our souls are lost until they find their homes in you. God, our lives are empty unless they find fullness and purpose in you. And so, God, I pray you be glorified in our lives and that you be glorified in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, hello from whenever you are watching this. My name is Casey Figueroa, and I'm extremely humbled to be able to have this opportunity to read a scripture with you all. The scripture I would like to share is from Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. As someone who has always had faith, I believe that the scripture has a lot of meaning to it. And it could not only pertain to me, but it could also pertain to you all as well. As we begin the next chapter of our life, it could be nerve wracking, scary, but also exciting. These past four years have been an extreme pleasure and an honor, but as we come to an end, let us not be satisfied with what we have overcome, but also be proud of our perseverance through 12 years of education and through a pandemic, might I add. As I read the scripture from Jeremiah, I could only be more comfortable to know that I will not be taking these next steps by myself. Through God, I will forever know that he has a plan for me and that I have to do this, that all I have to do is have faith and let him lead the way. And from what I can tell you, it's that we serve a reassuring God. Don't ever feel like no one, don't, don't ever feel like you have no one to turn to when you run out of motivation or when you feel like nothing is enough. Because the truth is, nothing is never enough unless you give it your all. And if that's not enough for you, it's okay. Sometimes it's okay to not be okay. And that is something that took me a while to understand. It is also something that grew me distant with my relationship with God. I was so wrapped up in getting college applications done, work, school, extracurriculars, and anything that would keep me from him to the point where I began to feel lost. But when I finally realized that I needed to reconnect with him and read a passage such as Jeremiah 29 verse 11, I knew that God has a plan for me and that it is all in his hands. I came to understand that the present is a gift and that you should take it all in and live in it. Thank you.
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching this. Um, class of 2021, I am humbled and honored to be speaking with y'all today. And first, let me say congratulations. For those of you that I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Mrs. Payne, and I am one of the school counselors at Prince George High School. And today, I want to share one of my favorite Bible passages with you all. And so this is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning at shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So what does it mean to run a race with perseverance? So even for those of you who do not know me, who do know me, you might not know that I'm an avid runner. I have run um, various races, including 10 half marathons and three full marathons. These days, I run mostly with my son and his jogging stroller. All of that said, I'm going to use this idea of a race as an illustration to encourage y'all this morning. And first, I want to commend each of you. Class of 2021, you are an exceptionally resilient group of young people. You were juniors when the pandemic first hit more than a year ago. Various traditions, rites of passage, normal routines the upperclassmen get to experience were either not possible for you or had to be completely rethought and done differently. Many of you have been learning virtually since March 2020 and have continued to do so throughout this entire school year. And all of you were thrown an unexpected curveball. But you all are immensely flexible and adaptable. You have gotten creative. You have pivoted and helped organize things like drive-in, homecoming events, and you've supported each other endlessly. You have run this K-12 through race and are literally at the finish line. You can and you should celebrate. You have received your medal, your water, your race goodies, and you should rest and celebrate. But you are not finished. This is only the beginning, the beginning of your journey in life after high school. Whether you are going on to college, trade school, the military, or straight into the workforce, you are still running. As a school counselor, one of my guiding principles is to remind y'all that you have everything you need to thrive and be successful. You have the tools. I have had the joy of working with some of you, whether your last name begins with A through Gilbert or you're applying to scholarships. You are a bright, creative, innovative, resilient group of young people. And that was before the pandemic. This has only increased exponentially since then. You are the class whose junior and senior year was interrupted by the pandemic, but you are here. You have made it and you are indeed surrounded by an enormous cloud of witnesses. These witnesses are your family, friends, teachers, administrators, coaches, choir teachers, band leaders, counselors, and we are here to congratulate you and help you throw off everything that's trying to keep you from running the race. So what does it look like to run the race with perseverance? Well, it looks like pacing yourself. It can be tempting to sprint it out at the beginning. The beginning of the race can feel invigorating and exciting, your adrenaline pumping, but it's important to remember that you are running a marathon here. We are focused on the long game, and this means giving life your best effort while also keeping in mind that it's all about finding a balance. In work or in school, you will need to find a balance that's sustainable for you and that might look different for each of you. Also, you need to fuel along the way. During a race, particularly those longer distances, there are typically fuel stops. And these are places where you can get Gatorade, water, and sometimes even a little snack like gummy bears. And for those of y'all who are athletes, you know that too. You always have your Gatorade on the sidelines and your snacks there. In your life, it's also important to take those little opportunities for respite physical, but yes, also spiritual and emotional. I would encourage each of you to ask yourself, what is life-giving for me? What replenishes me when I feel like I'm running on empty? 
quite literally, you do need to physically take care of yourself, but you can also have other practices, making time for fun with friends, maybe some kind of exercise, um, watching an episode of The Office, your favorite TV show, eating a favorite food or listening to music. Make time to fuel yourself along the way. And keep your eye on the prize. When you're in the midst of a marathon, especially when the end seems far off, it can be easy to lose sight of what you're working towards. This is where it's important to set goals and strive towards them. While you absolutely need to know where the finish line is, where you're headed, it's important to set smaller goals along the way and focus on how you can get to that next mile. Break it down into more manageable chunks rather than just thinking of way down the line what's, what's ahead. Um, and this goes right along with keeping your eye on the prize. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Make time to cultivate and nurture your relationship with God. That is so important in your life after high school. And since he is the never-ending spring of living water, if you fix your eyes on Jesus, you will never be thirsty while you run the race. And be encouraged. Be encouraged by folks on the sidelines. Remember to look to your side to see who's cheering you on. Surround yourself with that great cloud of witnesses, family, friends, and loved ones who are for you. And now I want to read that passage of scripture one final time. And while I'm reading it, I want to encourage you to consider how you're beginning your next race. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who has endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Congratulations, class of 2021. Run with perseverance, and please know that you will always have a great cloud of witnesses here in PG. Thank you.
Reverend Roger Lee Woodcock Jr. has served as Senior Pastor of Oak Lawn Baptist Church since 2018. Prior to serving as the Pastor of Oak Lawn, Pastor Woodcock served under Pastor Robert Lively as, a, as the Director of Family Ministries and Outreach. He was ordained to the work of the gospel ministry in 2017 by the Highland Heights Baptist Church in Rushburg, Virginia. And he also holds a Master's of Arts and Christian Ministry with a concentration in discipleship and church ministries from Liberty, Baptist Theological Seminary. Pastor Woodcock's pul pulpit ministry is characterized by his preaching verse by verse through books of the Bible, and he loves visiting his flock in their homes over coffee. Pastor Woodcock has been married to his wife, for, his wife Taryn, for 17 years and has three children in Prince George County Schools. In his spare time, Pastor Woodcock enjoys reading, drinking coffee, fly fishing, disc golf, and finding new places to visit with his family. Pastor Woodcock is passionate about the biblical literacy and helping Christians to know and understand what they believe in and why they believe it. He is considered to be the highest privilege to be a preacher of the Word of God and a servant of the Word of God. Well, I've been anxiously anticipating this moment for four years now. I came here to be a royal at the end of your eighth grade year. I love coming to baccalaureate uh, every year. and Most of the years that I've been here in the county, uh, I've been blessed with the opportunity to be a part of this service. Uh, I've been blessed to be able to do the Bible dedication for these services at times or, or to come and offer uh, a prayer but I've wanted so badly uh, in these years past to have the opportunity to address you, a class of royals, upon your graduation. There's very few people that are watching this at the time in which it is recorded. As a matter of fact, you might notice between the transitions in this video, uh, we met together, uh, the choir and all of the speakers were together a couple of weeks ago, and we recorded that service and we had some uh, technical difficulties. And so I'm standing in here today, and it's just me and one other person in this sanctuary. You know, some of you are watching this um, now. The, the moment that it's been posted to our church is Oakland Baptist Church's Facebook page or our YouTube channel. And some of you are watching this at a later date. And that doesn't really matter in terms of what I have to say and, 
And though this message is for the Prince George class of 2021, I trust that I have, uh, or what I have for the graduates this morning is also a message that will benefit each one of us. I want to talk to you about tomorrow, and I want to dwell on two things. I, I want to speak to you about the right use and the wrong use of tomorrow. And in doing so, the verse that I want to utilize from God's word is Proverbs 27, verse 1, and it says this. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Now, if you're not a Christian, I do pray that you would become one. Uh, that you would come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because he is the only Lord and he is the only Savior. I, I pray that you would submit to him as king and that you, would, that you would serve him all the days of your life. And I would love for you, if you would, to contact me in regard to that and to allow me to, to speak to you regarding the condition of your soul. But whether you be a Christian at this moment in time or not, this is a verse that I would ask you to consider. Do not boast about tomorrow. First of all, it's a very foolish thing to boast about anything. Boasting and, and, and bragging, they, they never make anybody greater in the sight of others. Uh, nothing is made better by boasting. The only thing that happens when we boast is people think less of us. If you boast about your possessions, you're not increasing their value. If you boast about yourself, you're not increasing your value. And, and to boast about tomorrow would be foolish because we've not obtained it yet. We've not seen it yet, and we, we might never see it. You know, tomorrow, it, it comes from God. It comes from God, and we have no right to boast about it. Many of you are 18 years old. If today is your 18th birthday by chance, you have lived 6,570 days. I've lived 14,170. And though many days have, have come to me that might not have come to you yet, don't think for a moment that tomorrow is a sure thing. My favorite preacher uh, once said this, days are not like links of a chain. Uh, one does not ensure that there will be another. You know, just, uh, just as that uh, is, there, there's no such thing as twin days. No two days are just alike. Today doesn't have a twin sister. Yesterday doesn't have a twin brother. Tomorrow is the absolute frailest thing in this world. And I think one of the worst things and, and perhaps the most foolish thing that we can say is there's always tomorrow. Or there's always next year. Because the truth is, is sometimes there isn't. There, there is not always tomorrow. And that's a truth uh, which many of us have learned the hard way. And in many cases, the hardest way. And here's the thing. Many, many people, they never achieve anything great because their, their hearts and their, and their minds are set on who they will be someday. What they might do someday rather than who they are today and what they might do today. Or what they should do today. You know, people will sit around and they'll, and they'll dream about what they can do for God tomorrow rather than actually doing something for God today. And it's totally inconsistent with the teaching of the Bible. Paul says in Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for man. You know, whatever you choose to do after graduation, whether that be going to college, work hard as for the Lord and not for men. Whatever you do, uh, if that be going into a trade, work hard as working for the Lord, not for man. Whatever you do, whatever it is that you choose to do, work hard, work for God and, and not for man. Because here's the thing, your, your hands will be extremely full if you work for God, but so will your heart. Work, work hard for him. And, and, and if you didn't start yesterday, start today, but don't wait till tomorrow. You know, don't wait for tomorrow. Don't boast about tomorrow. And having said that, having encouraged you not to boast about tomorrow and not to wait for tomorrow to do great things, I must also tell you something that's much more important. Don't boast about tomorrow. Or wait until tomorrow to consider your soul. I've met many men and, and many women and many teenage boys and many teenage girls that think that they've got until tomorrow to consider the truth about Jesus Christ. Some of you have gotten by with procrastination. I, I was many of you in high school and in college. Uh, I've actually waited until the day that a paper was due. Uh, by uh, midnight on a Sunday evening, I had a paper due, and I started writing it after church one Sunday, and uh, I turned in a 24-page paper at 11.58 that night. Look, don't do that in regard to wherever you find yourself in the days ahead, but especially do not bank on reaching midnight in regard to your soul. Here's the truth. 
Every moment of our lives is just another nail being driven into our eternity. You know, men boast about tomorrow saying that they've got, they've got plenty of time to get right with God. I've actually heard people say that they will do it when they're on their deathbed, and they'll say things, they'll tell me that they're going to say on their deathbed as they lie there, um, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's what a man, I heard a story one time, it's what a man told an old preacher once. It's a true story. The man was returning from a restaurant the very night he had told that preacher that earlier in that day. Well, the preacher had warned him, and that man never made it to his so-called deathbed. Here's the thing, I've never met anybody that was serious about eternity that was willing to trust or willing to put off trusting in Jesus until tomorrow. Please consider this. Many have missed heaven with good intentions in their heart. Good intentions to, to follow Jesus tomorrow. Let me ask you a question. If you were, if you were deathly sick, would you wait to call the doctor till tomorrow? Or, or if, you're, if your house were on fire, would you wait to call the fire department tomorrow? Or if someone were to, were to rob your house, would you wait to call the police tomorrow? No, you wouldn't. But the, but the condition of your soul, it's so much more important. And, and so do not boast in tomorrow thinking that you've got time before you're going to stand before God. Because chances are, and some of you have never heard this, you will not go to heaven just because you're on the honor roll or because you were the captain of the soccer team or the president of the Latin club. I was all of those things as a graduate of Rustburg High School in 2020. Actually, I didn't graduate in 2020. I'm much older than that. It was the year 2000. And it was very fitting for me that my mascot was a red devil. I was a Rustburg red devil. You see, I was a good kid from a worldly perspective. I made good grades. I wasn't running around with a bunch of girls. I didn't do drugs. I didn't drink in high school. I actually was the one uh, that recited the Lord's Prayer before every home soccer game. But here's the thing, and this is extremely important. I didn't know the one that I was talking to when I recited that prayer. And because of that, and, and I had no idea at the time, I was headed to a place that was very fitting for a red devil. Because the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter the amount of good I had done. Because I was a sinner. And you might say, well, Pastor Lee, you just told us that you were a good kid. I was, from a worldly perspective. But here's the thing. Good kids that don't know Jesus have the same tomorrow as the really, really bad kids. As the ones who are running around doing terrible things. But I came to understand one day, Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I came to understand that even though I didn't do some of those things that some of those other kids were doing, that I was a sinner. That it, that it wasn't just about what I did, but it was about who I was. And the Bible says that the wages for my sin during that time and at any time, the wages for sin is death. Because I'm a, because I'm a sinner, death is the penalty for that. And I, and I came to understand as I read this book that the only way for me to escape eternity separated from a loving and a just and a holy God was for me to bow down, in him, uh, bow down before him in submission and to place my faith in Jesus Christ and to turn away from my sin. I came to understand that, that even that sweet old lady down the street, that she was a sinner before a holy God. And without faith in Jesus, she stood condemned. I came to understand that my life was not about me. I came to understand that it was about God. I came to understand that a, that a life without Jesus is not a life, it's just an existence. I came to understand that while college degrees and, and good jobs and having lots and lots of friends are wonderful things, I came to understand that none of those would ultimately give me the satisfaction that my soul desired. Listen. If there is a hole in your heart as you're listening to these words, let me just tell you, I, I might not know you personally. And I'm not a cardiologist at all. But I know the exact size of that hole. And I know that a relationship with Jesus Christ is the exact same size as that hole. He's not just what you need tomorrow. He's what you need. He's what you need today. And so the question is, if tomorrows are nothing to boast about, are they worthless? 
No, they're not. They're absolutely not. There's many things that we can do with tomorrows. We, we, we can't boast about them, but as God's children, we can look forward to them with peace and with confidence. Because God promises us in, in Romans 8, 28, that, that for his children, he works all things for good. We can, we can look forward to them with joy. For the Christian, tomorrow is a happy thing because it brings us one step closer to seeing our Savior face to face. The, the Christian can, can comfort himself with tomorrow because though he does not know what tomorrow holds, he knows who holds tomorrow. And let me just say before I leave you, your community is proud of you. You've done so very well through such a tough time. Your churches are behind you. And on behalf of our pastors in Prince George, we love you and we're here for you. Let me uh, leave you with a benediction from Hebrews chapter 13. It says this. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the Lord, or from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hello, my name is Mallory Thompson, and I have the honor today to share my testimony. I'm a member of Gary's United Methodist Church here in Prince George and have been attending since I was about seven or eight. I've been active in youth group, mission trips, and virtually anything I could possibly do. To everyone at church, I seem like such a happy young girl. However, they didn't know that behind my smile and eagerness to help was brokenness. Despite it, I put on a smile and kept coming to church not necessarily for God, but for fellowship. I had found family within my youth group and church. As I kept coming and I kept learning more and more, I became on fire. Mission trips and youth retreats always sparked it, and I really didn't want it to burn out, but it did. Every time I came home, I had to face reality. Not everyone knows and believes in the same God that I do. They don't know of his love or his grace. See, the problem was that I was searching for acceptance in places I'd never find it. My freshman year was when my faith started to really grow and prosper. My freshman year was also my first serious relationship, and when he broke up with me, he told me that I was too religious for him. This was the first time I had ever felt shamed for my faith. This pushed me to be quieter about it and lose some of my passion. Someone who I'd been friends with since middle school made fun of me for posting daily Bible verses, so I stopped posting them, too afraid of what everyone else thought. Sophomore year, I kept looking for acceptance and friends who made fun of me for being the quote-unquote church girl. The more I felt ostracized, the more I pulled away from God. Weeks before my fifth youth retreat, I lost my best friend at the time and had a nasty, hateful post made about me by her new best friend. I'd never felt so alone. I was beyond ready for youth retreat that year. We got there Friday night, and by Saturday, I felt like I wasn't getting anything out of it. I remember walking around and talking to God. I said, I don't know what I'm doing or what I'm looking to get out of this weekend, but please just give me whatever you need me to get out of this weekend. And he did. Saturday night is always the cry night, and I've always been a very emotional person, but this night I completely broke. I cried the hardest I'd cried since my brother passed. I recall going to my youth leader and absolutely falling apart in her arms. And that night she told me, I think God speaks to you. A few moments later, I heard a voice tell me that everything was gonna be okay. Since then, I've only heard the voice a couple times. In Psalm 34, verses 18 through 20, it reads, the Lord is close to the, close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones, not one of them will be broken. In that moment of weakness and vulnerability of giving it to God, I knew that I was, he would see me through. My junior year was probably my worst year. I looked for acceptance in boys that would never see my worth or only see me as something they could use. I struggled the most in my faith journey and questioned if God was real. 
Throughout summer, I pined after boys who would only leave me feeling like I would never be enough, that I even really started to believe it. At this point, I felt broken, used, and unfixable. I hadn't been going to church because I was working so much, and church had become something less enjoyable after COVID took everything away. I remember one day telling my grandma that I didn't know if I believed in God or not. At the time, I don't think she realized that I was crying out for help. The one thing that had always been a consistency in my life had been taken. One of the main factors that made up who I was seemed lost. I felt like I was playing a role, but not very well. Eventually, I came to realize that God was always there, even if I didn't realize it. My senior year has seemed to be a year of growth and self-discovery. I started off doing really, really well and happy. Then November hit and I got broken up with again and seemed to be back to square one, feeling like I wasn't good enough, like I was unfixable and I was broken. This time though, I decided that I'd have to trust God. One thing I've heard is that God cares more about your character than your comfort. He will put you through some things that you're not sure why or if you'll even see, see through to the other side. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 through 10, it reads, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. There were times where I didn't know if I was going to make it. A few months ago, my best friend walked out of my life, and she was the last person I expected to leave. I thought God had put her in my life for a reason, but I guess sometimes God takes people out of your life for a reason too. I remember the last time we talked. I remember laying on my bed crying my heart out and begging God to give me the strength to stay. I didn't know that, I didn't know then what he had in store for me, and now I do. My high school years have been full of tears and joy and hurt and healing. My freshman year English teacher told me that you can't get through your teen years without a few tears. And I thank God for all the tears, all the happiness, all the love, all the hurt that I've encountered these past four years. All of this has made me the young woman I am today. As I get ready to graduate and move on to college, I ask God to show me my next steps and give me the courage to take them. For I have found my acceptance in a loving Father, who reminds me that I am fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. I may not be perfect or have life all figured out, but I do know one thing. God will meet me where I'm at and see me through to the other side. So to my fellow graduates, I leave you with this. Know that you are loved, and as you walk into college, you will never have to face anything alone. For God will be there lifting you up every step of the way. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Gano, and I'm extremely honored to be here with you today. When we entered high school, we did not expect that our junior and senior years would turn out the way that they did. We have overcome obstacles that many of us never thought we would have to overcome, from learning virtually to changes in sports, and unfortunately for some, the loss of loved ones due to COVID-19. We have learned to adapt different to different ways of learning different circumstances, at home with our jobs of our loved ones, and have to live differently than we ever thought we would with social distancing. As Christians, we enjoy the comfort of our home and our families with our friends, as well as sharing our love with others through fellowship and activities that have been difficult to arrange and enjoy because of the changing of circumstances and events related to the past year with COVID. After all the changes we have witnessed, and live through, we can still serve the Lord. As we come forward and prepare for college, vocational schools, or enter the military or workforce, how do we remain true to our beliefs in Jesus Christ and give back as he did as servant leaders? Let us be servant leaders. Let us go forward in the coming days, weeks, months, and years that this community has helped prepare us for by serving others as the Lord has served us and continues to serve us in all aspects of our lives. Let the Lord guide us and let us be more like him and his disciples as we teach others of his word. Let us do this while growing into leaders of the communities we will reach 
and as we spread our wings and graduate, opening to the next, check, next chapter of our lives. Servant leadership starts with being a servant first. As a servant leader, we focus on the needs of others first and acknowledge the perspectives of others while making decisions. As we become leaders for the Lord, when we open new chapters in our lives, remember that the Lord served his disciples. Remember those that he touched, that he washed the feet of his disciples. He broke bread with others. He wasn't scared of the sick and sought out the poor. He continued to be a servant, not reaching for the richest of the rich, but treated everyone with respect and dignity. Remember these things as we meet new people, as we embark on new journeys, and as we continue to teach and live in the name of Jesus Christ. Servant leaders keep in mind a number of characteristics which help them to be effective and remain servants first and foremost. Servant leaders listen, have empathy, use healing, have awareness, are persuasive, are able to conceptualize, have foresight, commit to growth of people, have stewardship, and help build communities. Servant leaders listen to others, to the concerns and ideas of others, and also listen to their own hearts as well as the continued teachings of the Lord. Servant leaders have empathy. We are able to understand and share the feelings of others while also understanding that their feelings may be different from our own. But we can accept the feelings that may be different from our own. Servant leaders help with healing. We know that our Lord Jesus Christ healed many. As servant leaders, we must allow others and ourselves to heal when we are struggling. We all have to overcome obstacles that may have losses throughout our lives. But we learn to grow and heal. He does not give us more than we can handle. As servant leaders, we need to have awareness. Awareness of others, what is going on around us, and to be aware of how we can use his teachings in order to help those around us. Servant leaders are persuasive. We use the energy the Lord has given to us to teach and persuade each others in a positive way to help all of us improve our way of living and improve our daily activities. As servant leaders, we are able to conceptualize and truly discuss the Lord, discuss the Trinity, and discuss how He remains and alive and true still today. We as servant leaders have foresight. We know that the Lord will return and that we will spend eternity in His house. We know that we will be okay through all struggles and obstacles because of what He has sacrificed for us. As servant leaders, we want to see others grow. We want to see others succeed, and we want to help them achieve and exceed their goals and aspirations. As servant leaders, we want stewardship and fellowship. As servant leaders, we want to utilize and manage all resources God provided for the glory of God and the betterment of His creation. Finally, servant leaders build communities. For us, this is very important. As we move forward into the next chapter of our lives, many of us will be moving to new communities and touching new lives, and we will help to further build the communities we are part of in the near future. These are many of the characteristics that we may use as servant leaders. We will all have new experiences in the next few months and the next few years that we did not expect to happen, but we will embrace them with love of the Lord. I challenge that each of you in 2021 Prince George High School graduating class to be servant leaders here and throughout the entire world. I will be moving to Eastern Kentucky University to start my college career, and I pray that I touch the lives of that community as a servant leader. Again, I challenge each and every one of you to be a servant leader as we open the new chapter in our lives. Remember what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58 states. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Thank you. Let's pray. Our Father, as we come to close out this service today, God, I ask that you would be with each of these graduates. God, that you would go before them, that you would make straight their paths. God, that you would keep them from Satan, that you would guard them from his schemes. God, I pray that you open our eyes, open their eyes to see that sin only leads to death. 
God, I pray that you use these students mightily, Lord, to do your work and to do your will. Father, that you would use them to win souls for Christ. God, we give praise to you for who you are. You're our King of kings, you're our Lord of lords, you're maker of heaven and of earth. God, we give you praise for what you do as our redeemer and as our sustainer and giver of all good things. And as we do that now, Lord, as we leave this place, may that be the position of our hearts, an attitude of gratitude, a song of praise, and a willingness to be used by you. In Jesus' name, amen.